My name is Marissa Kukas. I work with Paul Medical. Um, this is going to be kind of a little bit interactive session on rethinking water management. Uh, I'm, I'm obviously American. Uh, if I need to slow down or repeat something, please let me know. <laughs> so I'll go ahead. Just a little bit of a disclaimer. Uh, I do work for Paul Medical. I have been working in uh, water and water management within the healthcare space for about just under 10 years now. Um, and the last five and a half or so have been with Paul. I do have a certification in Legionella and water safety management um, and have really focused uh, most of my career on the education piece of it um, and doing presentations like this, um, both internally at Paul and, and externally as well. So the first question I have for you today is why are we still seeing waterborne outbreaks? Do you guys have any thoughts about why we're still seeing them with as much as we know? Old buildings, great answer. Any other thoughts? Yep, yep, to both of those, maintenance not getting done and stagnant water. Any other thoughts? Yep, it, new builds, it's, it's a great point, right? It's not just old buildings, also uh, reconstruction and, and new builds does stir things up and, and create its own set of problems. A few that I wanna highlight here, um, antimicrobial and disinfection resistance of some of the organisms. Um, so that includes obviously antimicrobial antibiotics and things like that, but also disinfection on surfaces and in the water. Um, some pathogens are becoming more and more resistant to that. The water management plan in some cases is not always comprehensive. Maybe the water management plan is focused on one or two organisms, Legionella and, and Pseudomonas most likely, um, but maybe it's, it needs to be expanded to include other organisms you're seeing in your facilities. Some blind spots um, as it relates to water management. So um, maybe newer pathogens, emerging pathogens, um, maybe some viable but non-culturable bacteria, which I'll talk about. Sometimes we see a lack of support on water safety group teams, um, and I don't know how much you in this room really experienced that, um, but certainly during COVID-19, I think that was the case, where we had a lot of resources that were being pulled a lot of different directions and couldn't always focus the right amount of time and energy on the plans. And, and that's nobody's fault, it's just the truth that, that that takes a hit on how well we are executing the plans. <laughs> Emerging pathogens, I mentioned this a little bit and we'll talk more, um, but if we're thinking a lot about Legionella, if we're thinking a lot about Pseudomonas, we may be missing um, some other pathogens like NTM, which can be quite difficult. Sometimes we see an overconfidence in water management plans. Um, sometimes this is the result of uh, doing a lot of water sampling and really taking that data as the only uh, picture of, of the health of the building. Um, sometimes it's assuming that you're, if you have another a secondary disinfection or supplemental disinfection that that's working better than um, it actually is. Many different kinds of transmission pathways, and we'll talk about some of the common ones and some of the ones we think about a little bit less. And um, just overall, under, underestimating the risk of waterborne pathogens, especially if water samples are saying things look fine and we haven't seen an outbreak and we think we completely understand all the technology in place uh, to support a water management plan, we may be kind of underestimating our risk. So, what we'll talk about today, uh, we'll talk a little bit about transmission pathways, as I mentioned. I'll talk about some um, current pathogens we see globally and in the UK, as well as emerging pathogens. Um, a little bit about what can go wrong, some more specifics about what we just talked about. Um, things to consider according to the research, according to, to case studies. And then I'll leave a little bit of time as well for some questions at the end. So, um, Next set of questions is, is what do you guys think of when you think of transmission pathways and how the infection makes it from the outlet to the patient? Um, what are some examples of that? Putting you on the stand and look vetment or vetment that you use just annually or yep. Yep. Some sort of procedure. Exactly, exactly. Any other thoughts? Quiet group in today. Sure. In the air, like an aerosol? Yeah, like respiration, respiration. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Yep. 
All right, let me, let me share a few. This is, of course, not an exhaustive list, but ones I think that are more common um, in some cases and others that are, are worth really taking a second look at. Cleaning with tap water is one of them. Um, and that's not just cleaning devices like uh, maybe a heater cooler or a ventilator, but it's also um, using tap water to top up disinfectants, which has been shown to be a transmission pathway. Oh, went too far ahead. Showering and bathing. I think this one is maybe a little bit more obvious to most of us, um, but especially bathing when we're thinking of bathing infants in the NICU environment um, or bathing, sponge bathing patients, and we're using tap water for that. Water used in procedures. Um, so this, again, uh, a heater cooler or a heart-lung machine um, has, has water as part of the unit, and that can be a risk in the uh, operating theater setting. Um, water used in something like dialysis um, in, kind, in procedures like that. When we're reprocessing medical devices, um, if we're rinsing with tap water, especially at, at the final rinse level, um, we need to be very careful um, to be using sterile water in those applications. Hand washing, of course, I think this, this one is, is probably um, pretty obvious to, to in this group. Um, in the States, I would say it's not always thought of as a transmission pathway. Drinking water, a um, little bit less of a concern in healthcare when we're talking about developed countries, um, but patients can still uh, be drinking while kind of lying down, and, and there could be some aspirating or choking, and that has been known to be an infection pathway as well. Splashing in aerosols, I think we all kind of think about this uh, with showers, but also taps. Um, the, the spread of splashing from a tap can be quite large um, in different, and onto the surfaces, into the air, um, always a consideration. I put dental lines on here because this is one that we see very inconsistent um, infection prevention around, um, coming from the dental clinics, coming from the manufacturers of dental chairs and things like that. But, um, it is one that we get a lot of calls about at Paul, um, is how can we help? Because it is, it, it's certainly using a lot of water. Infre infrequent maintenance, um, the, the things that we really think about here are um, things like filters being changed on time in different types of equipment, or um, making sure if you have a secondary disinfection system or supplemental disinfection that that system is being maintained properly, it's providing the right levels of disinfection, chlorine or whatever. Um, to be able to function properly and um, that that disinfectant is making it all the way to the outlet of the tap or the shower. And drains, um, of course, we, we're seeing a lot of publications coming out on drains, um, talking about multi-drug resistant organisms in the drain and that kind of the ability to splash out onto surfaces, into the air, et cetera. <coughs> So just a quick, a quick overview of some of the pathogens I want to highlight here, um, both in the UK and globally. Legionella is, of course, one that I think everybody knows about and thinks about. It is on the rise globally, um, here, everywhere else. Pseudomonas and Klebsiella are also on the rise globally. Um, they are more likely to be uh, multi-drug resistant uh, lately and disinfectant resistant. Um, and studies show that up to 50% of pseudomonas can make it from, from the tap to the patient um, in terms of transmission. So it's, uh, I know Legionella and pseudomonas are something that you think about a lot here in the UK and Scotland. Um, globally, that's not always the case, but it is becoming a little bit harder to, to treat in the water system or to you know, kill with a, an antibiotic with the patient. NTM is one that's um, kind of a, what I would consider still an emerging pathogen. And globally, this is, this is certainly the case, although I think different strains are um, more and more common in different areas. And I think one of the big ones that you see here in Scotland is Mycobacterium obsessus. Um, in other, other countries, you see different strains. But the, the issue across all of these strains is that um, it's quite expensive to treat a patient who has an NTM infection. It's quite expensive to try to um, control in the water system as well. And that's because it's difficult to kill. It's difficult to kill in the patient, and it's difficult to kill in the water system. Um, and I'll talk about this more in a second, but it really requires some special considerations for your plan. 
Uh, Cupria virus is another one I think that you guys probably know a little bit about here in Scotland. It's actually a pretty rare pathogen, clinically speaking. Um, but again, we want to be thinking about, in the water management plans, the, some of these pathogens that we're not actively thinking about or controlling for or testing for. Um, because sometimes if you know that your building has this in the water, um, you may need to, to make some extra changes, ex add extra layers of protection, especially for, for the vulnerable patients. Uh, and Acinetobacter is another one that we see rising globally. Um, I think overall the thing to, to consider here is if the plan that you have in place is really formulated around Legionella and Pseudomonas, um, and if it's really only formulated around those two, I think a lot of the data shows, and actually some UK standards are really highlighting this as well, that it's probably not going to be enough to control something like NTM, which is really a thick, uh, thick waxy outer layer. Um, it's pretty resistant to chlorine. So it's a mycobacteria. Yep, non-tuberculous mycobacteria. Um, and so it, it can be it can be quite difficult, and we we want to think about that, especially if you have you know are seeing it in water samples in your facility. Um, it may be worthwhile to add an extra layer of protection there uh, for, for more vulnerable patients. Okay, so what can go wrong? This, this is gonna be a bit of an elaboration about what we talked about up front in you know, where um, water management plans can use improvement. Something we don't talk a lot about um, is that there is a correlation between higher particulate or debris in the water and bacteria. And this is um, often known as something as the shadowing effect, where a bacteria can sort of latch itself onto a debris, piece of debris in the water. It then can sort of hide from UV disinfection or chemical disinfection, um, and basically, you know, make its way through the system unaffected. The other side is that many of the particulates in the water also become a nice nutrition source for the bacteria, and so the the if you can remove some of the particulate or debris in your water, then you're also more likely to see lower overall bacteria counts. We see a lot of overconfidence too, uh, globally, not specifically with this group, um, in, in the plans themselves based on having supplemental disinfection or doing water sampling. For water sampling, um, there is a, many bacteria can enter this VBNC state, which is viable but non-culturable. And what happens to these bacteria is in states of stress, uh, disinfection, or maybe at really high temperatures, the bacteria can become kind of dormant. And they won't um, cause infection in that state, but they also won't show up on a culture plate. They are also able to come out of that state eventually if conditions improve for them. Um, more nutrients are available or the temperature becomes more favorable, and then they can cause an infection. And so the thing about VBNC to consider is that if we're running a lot of water samples and, and really putting a lot of stock into the results of water sampling, that we might be missing something. We might be missing the fact that some of these pathogens are still in the water, even if that particular one is not causing an infection. Um, the biofilm life cycle is important to keep in mind here, too, in the plumbing. Um, as biofilm matures, it will start to shear off in the, under the force of water flow. Um, and so you, you could take a water sample in the morning, um, in the evening, you could take one on Monday, you can take one on Friday, and they may be drastically different due to something like this, due to just, it may be that the bacteria has sheared off or the biofilm has sheared off and um, it's making it into your water sample at that time, but at another time it's not. Antibiotic resistance, of course, um, makes it just a lot harder to treat some of these infections that, that may otherwise be relatively simple to treat or, or we understand what they are and, and how to go about it, um, just makes it a little bit more challenging when you're talking about pathogens coming from the water. Supportive water safety group team members. Um, I mentioned this in, in relation to COVID-19, and I, I think globally we have challenges here where um, we see lots of representation of certain types of groups in, the, in what should be a really multifunctional group. Um, so often I'll speak for the U.S. since it's where I'm based out of. Um, the, the estates are often the ones who take the majority of the workload there, and sometimes we don't get a lot of um, input from the infection prevention, infection control um, in, the, in the states. And that's because there's, there's so much work and so much understanding you need to have for a good water safety plan that it, it can be hard. It can be hard to 
spread those responsibilities. Um, and I think all of us are, are dealing with less and less resources available to, to really execute some of these plans. But a good plan um, has really that multidisciplinary support um, in terms of developing the plan um, and overseeing its, its ongoing um, execution, but also improving the plan where needed based on how it, it seems to be working. Um, the plan not func functioning as intended is a big one. So you have a plan in place and you think it's gonna be, it's gonna be great, but you find that you know, your water samples aren't giving you results that you're, you're very happy about. Um, or maybe you're, if you have a supplemental disinfection system that it's not seeming to perform properly, you're, getting a lot of, you're not getting a lot of chlorine residual at the outlet, for example. Um, this really needs to be you know, constantly reviewed and looked at and making sure that something, you know, is there a good reason why this is, the plan's not functioning the way that we need to and, and do we need to make a change? Sometimes um, the approaches can be a little bit simple. This is especially the case when you're talking about um, what I mentioned about controlling a lot for Legionella and Pseudomonas, but maybe you also have NTM, some sort of non-tuberculous mycobacteria in the water. And so um, are we, do we have multi-levels or multi-layers of um, different control measures to try to protect some of the most vulnerable patients against some of those organisms? And finally, um, not understanding the technology that you have in place as control measures. So if you're talking about filters, for example, do you understand the technology and what it's, it's claiming to do? Have you read the, the validation? Or um, if you're talking about disinfection, certain disinfectants are better against some pathogens than others are. And certain disinfectants um, are better at, at a certain temperature and a certain pH level to really perform optimally. And are, are we doing that properly? As, as a means to bring those uh, bacterial counts and the, just the risk lower. Couple things to consider in terms of research. Um, some, there have been a number of papers written about reducing water outlets, in, in, especially in the ICU environment, and completely removing them. Let's say it's a new building or a, a reconstruction, um, and we're just minimizing the amount of taps in the ICU environment, for example. And that has been shown to reduce um, the waterborne infections from that unit. Um, if you are choosing an outlet, are you choosing one that's really has been developed for healthcare? Um, I know in the UK you have many more types of options that are, are for healthcare. In the US, we, we don't necessarily, but you want to try to, as a rule, make sure there's not you know, this many parts and pieces. All, these, all of those nooks and crannies, bacteria can get in and colonize, um, create biofilms there, and then it's, it's right there near the end of the tap um, as, a, as a source for the patient. Uh, DNA exchange for pathogens. So some bacteria have an ability to um, transfer their genetic material to other bacteria that surround them. And this is especially concerning when we're talking about um, disinfection resistance, antibiotic resistance um, of any type. So if, if a bacteria can transmit that part of that gene or genetic information to another bacteria in the proximity, then you are increasing the likelihood that you're, you're going to see a problem in the future. Many more of those bacteria will, will live or you know, have the potential to infect a patient. Um, I, we get a lot of calls about um, filter you know, different studies about filters as it relates to um, being an infection route. This is, a, this is always the case with a filter that's not changed on time. Um, and it could be any type of filter, but a special, a special caution around carbon filters. Um, and that's because carbon in and of itself, you know, it's, it's reducing the chlorine, but it also is a great nutrient source for bacteria. And so it's very, very important that we're making sure to change that on the, requ on the re required schedule for the process. Um, and it's also important to recognize that filters have different life requirements, whether it's um, t length of time or, or gallons, and we need to be making sure that, that's, that those changes are happening. And that's true of carbon filters. It's true of any type of other uh, filter that you have in the hospital. And then finally, um, the limits to disinfection efficacy. So even if your disinfectant is being used at the appropriate temperature, um, appropriate pH level, it's still, it's still a likelihood that um, it's not going to be able to kill everything in the system, 
there's still a likelihood that um, some pathogens will be able to survive it and some won't. So you could be kind of creating a, an environment where you allow certain pathogens to thrive because other ones have been killed and that lack of competition um, is at play. So when you're thinking about, if, especially if you're doing supplemental or secondary disinfection, when you're thinking about that, you want to think about um, what you're seeing in your facility. And if you're bringing a, a supplemental disinfection system online, is that going to control for that pathogen or do you need to um, consider other options or additional options? <laughs>